Good morning, everyone. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Dr. Michelle DeMarzo. I'm the Curator of Education and Academic Engagement at the Fairfield University Art Museum. And I'm delighted to welcome you virtually to the first in our Fall 2021 series of Art and Focus events. If you've attended any of our other virtual events so far this fall, you might know that the museum's tagline right now is, the art is live and the programs are virtual. That's because we are delighted to say that both the Bellarmine Hall Galleries and the Walsh Gallery at Fairfield University are back open to the public. We're open Tuesday through Saturday from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. You can find more information on our website at fairfield.edu museum. Masks are required and the university recommends vaccination or a negative test in advance. You can read more about that on our website. But the long and short of it is that after 18 months of only being open to the university community, we are delighted to welcome people back to the galleries. We have two spectacular exhibitions on view up here in Bellarmine Hall, and that is also where you can drop in and see the artwork that is the focus of our Art and Focus session today. So if you come into the Bellarmine Hall galleries, you'll see our print cabinet has been moved back into the center of the space. And uh, we know that folks are not always, don't always feel comfortable or empowered to open the drawers of a print cabinet. So we added the little placard at the top that says, open me. And if you open that very first drawer in the print cabinet, you'll find the print that we are here to talk about today. So I hope you will take advantage of this and come see us and open that drawer and take a peek at this object in person. For the interim, since we are still virtual with our programs, here's the digital image that we'll be looking at together. This is a print by the Japanese artist Utagawa Kunimaru, the courtesan Sumonura. And I'm gonna apologize for my Japanese pronunciation as I am not a Japanese speaker, so I'm sure I am mangling these names to some extent, of the Azazutaya <laughs> with a young attendant dating from about 1820 to 1825, a color woodblock print that was gifted to the museum by James Reed. If you followed the museum over the last couple of years, you know that Jim Reed has been extraordinarily generous with the collection of prints ranging from etchings and engravings to many lithographs uh, and also a number of Japanese woodblock prints. So we're delighted to be featuring another example of Jim's generosity toward the museum. And quite frankly, this print is a huge fam a favorite among we, the museum staff. We just absolutely loved it from the moment we we're looking through the latest pile of acquisitions from Jim of his generous donations and we saw this, we all agreed, this is one we wanted to have on view as much as possible. Uh, and keeping them in the print case is actually uh, easier in a lot of respects than putting this in a frame and hanging it on the wall because these are paper objects. They are sensitive to light. So keeping them in a drawer where they're only open for a few seconds or a few minutes at a time is a little bit healthier. Um, if we put her up on the wall, this print, we would have to cycle it down and let it rest um, every couple of months. So this is a way for us to have more chance to share this print with the public. As I said, I hope you will come and see in person. So aside from being a strikingly lovely object, uh, what do we see? And back in the before times when we had art and focus in person, we would sit on our uncomfortable stools around the art object and just let the group call out things that they were noticing. You're welcome to do that, by the way, in the quick live chat and also put in any questions as I go along that you might have. Uh, one enterprising viewer named Jane took the opportunity to send in her questions in advance. So I'll try to address uh, some of the questions that Jane had. But looking at this thing sort of from top to bottom and seeing what we notice about it. For example, one of the elements that draws my attention is this little inset detail on the upper left that has what seems to be a, um, a placard coming down to the right and a view of a little landscape scene. You can see sort of the roof of what might be a building hiding in among what seem to be pine trees. There's a flow of white that makes me, puts me in mind of a waterfall. Uh, there's hills and mountains in the background. And that detail also lets you see at the very top of the sheet, there's this wonderful light pink shading and flowers impressed on the piece of paper. That's something that I'll come back to in a few moments. But I feel like I jumped ahead. This is a place where if we were in a group, different people will say they noticed something different first. 
So my eye is drawn to that little inset detail. I immediately want to know this doesn't seem to match the rest of the picture. What's going on there? But I think for many people for whom this is the first time they are encountering this print, your eye is going to be drawn to the figure in the center. She takes up the majority of our composition and she's not alone. You might see that there is a secondary figure peeking out from behind her. But what we're looking at is a beautiful woman who is wrapped in multiple layers of extraordinarily elaborate kimono. And it almost seems to be that we've caught her in the act of arranging her clothing or getting ready perhaps to go out. The position of her attendant sort of behind her seems to suggest that her attendant is helping her with her immensely complicated but um, beautiful attire. And I really love the flow of the line that the artist has used. I'm gonna put my mouse over the image. In this lower area of the outer kimono, where you're really seeing all of the different layers of what would be fabric of different colors, different patterns. We can imagine maybe different weight and texture and all of it captured in this sort of swooping swirl of line as if she's twirling around a little bit for us to see. I also appreciate the way the lines around her back we see that the outer kimono is sort of lowered down from her shoulder. So we're seeing a little bit of the layers underneath. And I have to say that the thing that I love most about this particular print is that marvelous sort of ombre effect of the dark purple at the edges of the outer kimono and then fading into this sort of dawn-like pink further down. And we can see that that outer kimono is decorated with butterflies, with grasses. And it's just a really stunning, set of textiles. I don't say one textile because it's, it's very clear from looking at this, we are seeing an elaborate arrangement of kimono wrapped around this woman. Jane, who is the woman who sent in some questions in advance, one of the questions she had was about the hair and the hair ornaments. Because if the clothing is extraordinarily elaborate, I think we can agree that what's going on with this courtesan's hair is also extraordinary. So, I'm sure I have some, oh, there's my close-up detail. You see that her hair and the artist has taken such care into sh showing how it has been sharply pulled back from the face and arranged into these sort of concentric volumes that are piled quite high on her head, suggesting that she's got quite a lot of hair if her hair was to be unbound. And then there are ornaments applied, stuck into her hairstyle all over her hair we see two crossing in the front of her forehead. There is the implication of maybe a fabric ornament, something else that is a sort of a blue gray that seems to have been applied to the back of the hairstyle. Now, I cannot tell you that I could replicate this, this hairstyle in any way if you challenge me to right now. But what I take away from it as a viewer is that like the clothes, it speaks of someone who has servants to attend them, to help this arrangement first of fabrics and then this extraordinarily complicated headdress, this couldn't be a woman who's on her own. And I don't think the inclusion of the attendant is by any means accidental. So we're being shown this is a woman of enough status to have a servant to attend her, to attend her clothes. And we can imagine to help her bring that extraordinarily complex hairstyle into life. It doesn't look particularly uh, comfortable, I would say to me, but it does look like a, a work of aesthetic production in its own right, as much as the fabrics that she's wearing. I wanna go back to this detail for a moment, because if you've looked at um, Japanese prints at any point in the past, maybe in one of our other Art and Focus events, you might be familiar with seeing so much written text on an art object which I think we find less, for example, in the Western European painting tradition that we're familiar with. We are less commonly um, attuned to seeing words, but Japanese woodblock prints from the 19th century are full of text. They are assuming, we might say, a, a literate audience who is going to be understanding who this person is and what this print is all about, which was another question that Jane sent in. She asked, you know, who is this woman? Why was she worthy of being portrayed? And the reason that we have the name of not only this courtesan, Sumonura, but also of her assistant is because the artist has sketched in, in Japanese characters, of course, 
in columns going from right to left, top to bottom, has given us all sorts of information about the title and the subject of the print. So this little inset detail, which I said I am particularly fascinated by, uh, this gives us the series title. So we have one object that is part of a larger series by Utagawa Kunimaru. And that series title that is in this yellow bordered area in the inset is the Fashionable Six Jewel Rivers. So this was a series of portraits of famous courtesans, these famous beauties of the capital city of Edo, each of them being compared to a famous jewel river of Japan. And next to are the close-up of Sumanura herself. Oops, and there's her attendant. I didn't show that detail before, peeking out. And uh, since we're talking about hairstyle a moment ago, you'll notice that her attendant also, we can get a sense that she's wearing layers of kimono and her hair is also in an extraordinary elaborate hairstyle. So she may be the attendant, she may be a servant, but she's not wearing her hair loose around her shoulders. Her hair is not quite as full of elaborate ornaments as um, her mistress here, but certainly she is demonstrating a lot of care to her appearance as well. Oh, and how could I forget this detail? You see what happens when we're not doing this organically in a group, but rather in a series of images that I had to select and arrange in advance. Just visible on this wonderfully high wedge sandal that the courtesan is wearing, you see her bare toes peeping out. I think that's such an incredible detail. And also you're really seeing both the swoop of the lower layers of kimono. And in that detail, you're also able, I think, to make out that there is a very delicate pattern colored in here on what might have seemed in the original image. They might have just sort of looked blank, like we're just seeing the bare paper underneath. But in fact, it's not true. So in between those black and green layers, there's a layer of sort of lawn color that has this geometric pattern. So another layer of uh, sort of visual delight to take, I would say, in what we're seeing. Now I'm just asking myself, in what order did I put these and why did I choose this? But I'll use my mouse instead. We have the, the image together on screen. So we have the title of the whole series is with the inset here. Next to the courtesan Sumanura, the furthest right column gives her name and the house from which she came. So they're in the largest characters. Quite small next to that is the name of her attendant. So it's not just Sumanura who is um, deserving of being remembered, her attendants, which I wrote down somewhere and then let it go. Her attendant's name was Ukuno Namishi. So that's also given to the reader and viewer to understand both of these women and who they are. Japanese prints are almost always signed by the artist. So we find the artist's signature in the column here, Utagawa Kunimaru. And below that, these two seals give us even more information. That top round seal is the seal of the censor approving this for publication in the sometime in the 1820s and then the cartouche below that contains um, a reference to the name of the publisher so the person who commissioned this artwork this whole series from the artist and then put it out there into the world and his name is Yamadaya Shojiro so as I said a oh, Japanese print is just rife with all of this literary information this verbal communication as much as it is in sort of wowing us with the extraordinary array of colors, of textures, and as I said, the sort of sense of emotion of these beautiful garments moving around this very beautiful woman. I'll turn now to a question that um, Jane had raised also. Um, and Jane was asking, is this a production of a single artist? And both on the caption that I used at the beginning, I'll give you the, go back to the caption for a moment, so we can see the spelling of the artist's name, which is written, as I said, in Japanese characters going down on the left side. So he's the artist that we give credit to for this print. But in fact, like so many forms of visual art, Japanese woodblock prints were very much the result of a collaborative process. So Utagawa Kunimaru, who came, who trained in the same school that would later um, produce uh, Utagawa Hiroshige, who was one of the most famous woodblock artists of the 19th century, Utagawa being the name of the school in which they, they trained and took on the name of, he is the individual who came up with this design, and he would have drawn on paper the sketch of this courtesan. 
he would then have delivered that to the publisher and the publisher would have arranged to have it carved onto a wooden block. So what's interesting is that what's not included in the text on the image, we get the name of the artist who designed it. We get the name of the publisher whose business it was to put these out into the world. But we are missing some pieces of information on almost all Japanese woodblock prints. One being the name of the person or persons who cut the blocks for printing. And then the name of the person or persons who pulled the impressions, meaning who inked the individual blocks laid down the paper using very precise what are called registration marks to line up the sheet on block after block. We can think of them kind of akin to stamps where each area of color would need to have its own block where only those areas, areas for example that we might want to color in black, only those areas would be raised and the paper would be laid down precisely rubbed to let the ink sit in or sink in peeled off, allowed to dry, and later applied to a different stamp, maybe with only the areas that would be inked in red sticking up. It's an incredibly elaborate process. It's fascinating to watch, and I encourage you to look, for example, on YouTube. You can find uh, many examples of artists doing woodblock prints to give you a sense of the process. I like to recommend to my students uh, an eccentric gentleman by the name of David Bull, who is, I'm not sure if he's Canadian or American, but he moved to Tokyo decades ago and now operates a traditional uh, woodblock print shop in, um, uh, in Japan using only traditional materials, working with Japanese artisans and craftspeople. And he shows you the whole process from start to finish in so many of his videos. So if you are interested in that, I encourage you to seek it out. Uh, but that is a great question that Jane brought up, this notion we have of authorship we're usually very focused on, but who is the artist, capital A? But in fact, Utagawa Kunimaro alone could not have brought this object into creation. He's responsible for the design, but almost certainly did not have any involvement in cutting the block or inking and pulling the individual impressions. Um, and that was true also, I would say, of Western artists quite frequently. I'll just to give one example, if you're familiar with the German artist Albrecht Dürer, 16th century artist, he was unusual in that he would design woodblock prints and cut them himself. So the fact that he was unusual tells us something about how the practice worked uh, in Western Europe at the time. Similarly, in 19th century Japan, think of this as a big commercial enterprise. And the output of the commercial enterprise, the print, the series of the fashionable Six Jewel Rivers, our individual impression of this particular courtesan, would not have been luxury objects. These prints, which are often referred to as ukiyo-e or floating world prints, took on subjects from the cosmopolitan life of what we know as Tokyo, but was then Edo. So we're talking about a city that by the 18th century had a million inhabitants. It was a bustling commercial and cosmopolitan center. And these prints for a very low price, for about the price of a cup of noodles, you could have an image of famous actors, courtesans, scenes of theatrical entertainments, scenes of the city at night. So the floating world conjuring up the, um, the impression, let's say, of the peaceful cosmopolitan life under the control of the shogunate of Japan at the time. Which, since I mentioned before, the seal of the censor being applied to this image the images that came out of the ukiyo-e prints were required to receive government approval. And what, were, what was the government looking for? Well, they were trying to make sure that there was no licentious or immoral uh, content, but also anything that might be considered seditious against the government. So you will often find these round um, seals that just mark this as having been accepted for publication. Um, I had a question coming in, I see from Gina saying, how do you get that ombre effect with woodblock printing? And Gina, I will be very honest with you and say that I cannot explain it as well as if you could watch it on a YouTube video. Uh, so I will encourage you to seek it out. I'm never ashamed to say when I don't know something, uh, especially since my background is in Italian Renaissance art and very much not the extraordinary art of Japanese woodblock prints. But that ombre effect does bring me to mentioning something. As we had this object in the collection, of course we want to know more about it. Um, art historians are always fascinated by provenance, meaning who owned an object before it came to the museum. 
in an ideal world, um, we would know every step of the custody chain between when this was produced in Shojiro's uh, workshop or his, his publication enterprise and when it came to the museum. Unfortunately, that's often not true. So the only step of the provenance we know is that Jim bought it um, and with a group of other prints, and then he later donated it to the museum. But we can look for other examples of the print and other museum collections to get a sense of what other examples are out there. And it just so happened, I'm going through our lovely details again, that there is another impression of the same print, so the same design, but another physical example in the British Museum. And what really struck me is how different the color appearance is. So Gina was just asking about that ombre effect in the back of the outer kimono, which is of course one of the things that has struck us uh, among the museum staff is just so lovely. And it's not there. So clearly it's the same block or set of blocks that are being used to ink and mark the outlines of the artist's design, but the color choices have been made differently. And in fact, this um, example that's in the British Museum has just an entirely sort of different color palette being used. It also seems to be sort of lowered in tone in the sense of a sort of a greenish yellow cast. Some of that can be age. You can see many marks on frankly both sheets of paper, sort of marks of, of foxing of um, just the, the damage to the paper over time. But it is striking that ours is so vibrant and chooses such extraordinarily vivid colors of pink and of purple, and that we don't see those choices being made in the example that is in the British Museum. Oh, uh, sorry, I'm pointing out that we have a question coming through in the chat also from Carmen who asked, what type of paper are these objects on? Uh, that is a great question and in our teaching collection as part of the museum, we have examples of uh, Japanese paper. It's very finely woven. It is wonderful to feel under your fingertips. It's quite thin. And I know this with the example of ours because helping to put it in the case, um, moving it into its, um, into its mat, it's very thin, it's very delicate, but it does have to be fairly resilient to absorb all of the ink in the printing process. So you, you can go to any art supply store and you can acquire a sample, that's what we did for our samples, acquire a sample of the kind of paper that is being used. There are multiple um, different types, but the one that is used for our particular impression is, is very fine and really quite soft under the fingertips. So I said that I was a little surprised by finding this example in the British Museum because it looks so much different than ours. And one question that raised for me working in the museum knowing from, again, I'm not a specialist in, in Japanese prints, but I do know that um, prints would not only have a, a print run of hundreds or maybe thousands, but those blocks could also be recut later by the publisher. And that goes back to the idea of, you know, the collaborative process. The publisher is the one who retains the rights to the image, not the artist. It's the publisher who set this whole thing in motion and they control the output. So we know that publishers could recarve blocks that have been damaged over time that have been worn down by the simple act of impressing and rubbing so many different pieces of paper. Uh, we have an example, if you come visit our museum, of a 19th century print by Hiroshige and then a 20th century recut of the exact same composition. So you can compare the two of them directly in that uh, print cabinet. So I did wonder if what we might be seeing in our impression Maybe this is a, a sort of a later print run, different choices being made. And then in looking a little bit further afield, I was delighted to come across in a museum in Vienna, the Museum of Applied Arts, not an example of our courtesan, Sumanura, but rather, there's a, they actually have three, these two are on screen, are examples of other prints from the same series by the same artist. So that intrigued me a lot because I noticed perhaps not as um, brilliantly colored as the kimono that our impressions courtesan is wearing, but I noticed some details that seem to join our example with these two. One of them being this pink circle that we find underneath the artist signature on both. I'm just gonna go back to ours. Ours has that pink circle the British Museum, if it was there, it's very faint. And also what I don't see in sort of the topmost area of the British Museum's impression 
is this, again, ombre effect of pink with the uh, embedded flowers. But we do see it in the examples that are in Vienna. So if nothing else, it suggests that our object here at Fairfield is perhaps a sister printing of these depictions of other courtesans that are in these examples that are in the museum in Vienna. This is still something that we are continually looking for more information on objects that we have. If you have expertise and knowledge to share with us, please do reach out. We are always excited to learn more from specialists. And I'll take this opportunity to thank Dr. Eva Kovacci, who is our specialist in East Asian art, who made sure that I was saying the right thing about where all of the pieces of information that I said were encoded in the text, where they are on the print. I mean, I wanted to make sure that I was relating it accurately since I do not, in fact, read Japanese characters. Uh, Carmen asked when it was acquired and do we know the current value of this woodcut? So if I go back to our initial image, uh, it was a gift from James Reed and what's in brackets there at the end of the caption is the accession number. So the unique identifier the museum gives to each of its objects and ours, uh, when you see a year, that's usually the year of its acquisition. So Jim donated it to us in 2019, so it's only been with us for a couple of years. Uh, putting it in the print cabinet a couple of weeks ago is the first time it's actually been on view and not in our print storage room, so we're really delighted to have it on view to the public. I don't have any information on what the value of a print like this would be, except to say that to us it is priceless. Uh, and certainly I haven't been able to find many others, so if you find one on eBay, you know, do, let us, do let us know. Uh, Sam Pryor, someone who seems to have some experience with Japanese that I do not, says he's struck by the way the third kanji down, kanji being Japanese character, has a flow and shape that echoes the image itself. That's really wonderful. Um, I, again, it's like that's the joy of looking at art collectively is that people bring something to viewing an object based on their own knowledge and experience and opinions that I don't have. So that's wonderful. It makes me only more excited to when we can do this in person again. Uh, Janet comments that the courtesan's facial expression seems to indicate that she doesn't like her privacy disturbed. Well, I think that is a, a great observation. Where's my close up of her face? That's great. I see her as focused very much on, well, maintaining control of all of her garments. You know, there is certainly a sense that she's been caught in the middle of something. So Janet looks at this and sees a woman who would rather not perhaps be the subject of art. Uh, and I do think the artist has taken pains to not show either of these two women making eye contact with us, the viewer. So it is a sense we have caught them in some moment of preparation. We are seeing a little bit behind the veil, as it were, as they get ready for whatever it is they're about to do. And Peg comments, the seals are different also. Ooh, that is a great observation. I'm guessing that Peg is commenting about the difference between these seals. And Peg, if you wanna throw more information about your comment um, into the chat, please feel free to go ahead and, and do that. Uh, so there's always more to be observed and more to be enjoyed about these art objects. And I'll just go back to our image of the work where it's on view in um, the gallery. If you don't know, also all of our objects, both those that are on view in the galleries and those that are in our permanent collection, you can access them online through our website. So if you go to fairfield.edu slash museum and you click on collection, that will take you to our collections database. So if you're just interested in browsing what other art objects we might have from Japan, for example, you can do that. You can look at every print that James Reed has so far donated to the museum. And who knows, it might strike some of you that you would like to uh, donate a work of your own to the museum and see a little accession number uh, after your name. But I don't see any more questions coming through the chat. I'll just remind you, you can drop by the Bellarmine Hall Galleries Tuesday through Saturday from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. to see the Courtesan Sul Menura or any of our other works or our two new exhibitions, Roberto Lugo, New Ceramics, and Robert Gerhardt, Mic Check. And we will look forward to seeing you at our next virtual Art and Focus. And we hope in the very near future to be back together in the galleries doing this. And thank you to everyone who sent in questions and also comments. Oh, and I spoke too soon. Nazarina says, I was wondering how the museum finds the other prints, if someone told the museum or the museum did some research. That's a great question. 
Uh, in this case, uh, we uh, had already known just from searching the title, once we knew the title of our print, we searched, we found the one that was at the British Museum using their collections database. And I was using an online website whose name will now escape me that collects images of different variants of ukiyo-e prints. And it was through that means that I found that there were these other prints in the Vienna Museum of Applied Arts. And then of course I went over to their museum collection database. So the wonder of the digital era is all of these museums trying to make their collections as um, not only accessible to the public, but also to other museums, other researchers, so we can just share knowledge and increase the amount of information that is available and that is out there. So I'm always deeply appreciative of museums uh, that do such great work to make their collections databases accessible. Our registrar, Megan Pacwa, is daily at work making our museum collection database also as, as up-to-date as we can make it. Uh, and someone, Lauren Perlman, also chimes in saying uh, she used to sell ukiyo-e, and now she sells Japanese paper, which is a great. Thank you for joining us, Lauren. So as I said, so delighted to have so many of you watching with us today. We look forward again to the next virtual art and focus, and then one day doing this together. Maybe we'll have to revisit the courtesan Suminura because I think she's she's just so lovely. She deserves a look in person. So thanks so much, everyone. I hope everyone has a wonderful day.